The nude has been the subject of the photographer since the inception of photography. Taking its cues from paintings, these early photographs sought to validate the new art form, which was seen as more an advancement in technology than a new art. Many classic photographs were taken by the likes of Alfred Stieglitz, Harry Callahan, Nobuyoshi Araki, and Robert Maplethorpe, with the great majority being made by male photographers. There have, of course, been noted exceptions, including Sally Mann, Imogene Cunningham, and Eleanor Carucci, who have produced seminal work that not only reveals the beauty of the human form, but also challenges ideas of sexuality, power, and objectivity. One of the photographers who I believe has excelled in this genre is Mona Kuhn, a Brazilian-born photographer whose images combine a sensitivity to light, shape, and form, while also examining issues of intimacy and vulnerability not only of the subject, but the photographer. Her recent book, Mona Kuhn Works, brings together decades of her projects and demonstrates the many ways she has challenged the way we see ourselves and others. This is Ibadi and X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Well, I'm fine. I'm so pleased to finally have a chance to, to, to talk with you. How are you? I'm, I'm really good. I'm good, especially now that I'm, I'm going to have a chance to talk to you about your work, because ever since I discovered it, I have just loved it. Oh, my God. And you, you didn't even get the book yet. I mean, yeah, I did. Yeah, oh, I got you it did. Uh, three, two days ago. Fantastic. So I finally got it. Okay. It, I think it's important because it's such an overview and it's kind of, you know, like a, with nude, nudes are sensitive subjects. So I don't put too much online. Yeah. I, try to, I try to avoid it. It's been really interesting because the, the book is sort of a comprehensive look at your, your career and your work. And there were moments that I had missed from different periods. So right. it was really nice to see sort of see the progress. But it was really interesting seeing the early work. Mm -hmm. And seeing that there's an attention to line and shape that's really consistent throughout your entire career. And I, I saw it especially with, with the nature images that you were doing, sort of the right. landscapes you were doing. Right. And it was just really lovely to see a photographer's sort of evolution, to see sort of a through line, but also see the ways they've changed and experimented. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when you took a look at the at the work and you were editing the book, did you see that? Did you experience any sort of surprises when you were looking at your work collectively? I never look back. So I'm always looking for things that I want to do as I go forward. I, I think that, you know, I came here from Brazil mm -hmm. and I started studying. I went to Ohio State and looking back was always painful. I would miss my friends. I would miss my family. So I stopped looking back and I always looked forward. And this was the first time in 2019 when the publisher from Thames and Hudson, a Andrew Sanigan, reached out to me. He said, would you like to do a retrospective? And I was taken a little bit aback because first of all, I think it's a little early. I'm not that old. <laughs> but, <laughs> but secondly, because I never even thought about it. I never thought about actually stop time and look back at everything you have done and kind of reflect. I maybe thought it was too much of a Pandora's box. So uh, it was interesting because we started the conversation in the end of 2019. And then in 2020, suddenly the pandemic arrived. And I think if it wasn't for the pandemic, I wouldn't have been able to do the book just because I wouldn't have had this, in a way, precious moment to look back and open the files again and remember the conversations I had with all these people I photographed. And I don't only have files and, and images of people that I photographed. I also have correspondence. I have emails. I have letters. I have notes. So it was like going back in my life, in their lives. And it, it was good. Then what you're saying, if I knew that there was a thread throughout, I don't think you know when you're doing it. But... At this moment in time, when I look back, I see that thread, like you mentioned. Is it what something I noted or was it something else that you saw? No, I don't know. Like, if, you know, at the very beginning of the book, you have some of my very early black and white images. And on those early black and white images, when I knew that I wanted to photograph the nude, uh, at the time you had people like 
it was maybe late 90s, early, no, late 80s, early 90s. And you had people like uh, Helmut Newton and Herb Ritz, and they were photographing the full figure, very sharp, very present. And it was the part of photography that it was more about show and tell. And it was recording that image of a person in front of you. So look, this person happened to be in front of me, and I was the one that photographed the person. And I wanted it to be more of a pendulum. I wanted to use the part of photography that is more in your imagination. I was also a little afraid of photographing nudes at the beginning because it has been done so much. So how do you add a word to this long conversation? And how do you do it in a way that you would like it to be done? So I had to also figure out what is it that I think should be done or bring in, I think, one of the ideas that I had or one of the what was leading me to find my my voice, my 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 language was a little bit just looking at the art uh, in museums and look for that moment that you almost have when you're young, that you go to a museum and you're mostly alone. When I was younger, the museums were kind of empty. So when you would go to a museum, you would go there almost like if you go to a church, you just sit and ponder. That's all we would do at museums. So I would go, you know, my mother would have a very busy social life. And as when I was a teenager, it was much easier for her to drop me off at the museum while she would go see her girlfriend. And then she would pick me up uh, two hours or three hours later. And I loved it. It was great for me. I would stay there and would wait, would walk around and kind of just wonder what kind of work of art would give me that, you know, that mini levitation Right. Mm-hmm. Like you look at something and you're like, wow. And you, and you just feel like you're so connected. Uh, you don't know that artist, that artist is like 200 years ago, but there's some energy in the thing that resonates with you. So I would constantly, I had this game, I would just constantly go around and figure out which pieces I would have that reaction. Did, did you gravitate to a certain period, a, a certain artist? There were there were many different ones, but I realized I gravitated always to people, uh, and and mostly a sense of a sense of like calmness and a sense of pleasure, a sense of relaxing, a sense of you know like bathing, nudes in the garden, or that kind of where people were in maybe domestic scenes or maybe scenes where they were unguarded. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the things that I really liked about it, and sometimes when I described your work to other people, I'm sometimes reluctant to say that, oh, they're nudes. Because I think that with that word, a certain assumptions and sort of expectations are attached. Yeah. And I feel like you're doing so much more than photographing a nude. One of the things that really sort of appeals to me is the way that you use light, how you use subtle gradations of tone and color. Right. and, and, And line and shape. Oh, and, 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 and also the relationship of the figure to the space. Right. You know, you're doing so much more. It just seems like you're doing a lot of interesting stuff. And, oh, there's a nude in there as well. Exactly. At times, I feel like I'm a doctor. I have seen too many nudes. It's not, it's not, it's not really about the nude. It's about what else is happening there. And how do we communicate metaphors? Like, how do I bring a metaphor to a human presence is really before it is a nude, it's a human in front of me. And I think that that part feels like a gift, feels like a gift of the person that gave the time and the patience to be with me, to collaborate, to create something together. You know, it's also a gift of trust. They trust me. There is a a lot of things that we talk about that I always tell them, if you don't like an image, I don't need to use it. I, there's never a pressure for things to work out. We, we try different things. We, I enjoy the time being with them. If there's no good image that comes out of it, it's also fine with me. Yeah. But, but what you were talking about, the, the, early, the earlier work, it might be interesting to know that when I started photographing nudes, I wasn't comfortable photographing the full figure. So my very early attempts, my very early renderings, were close up. You know when you used to study art history and you would have a whole tableau and then you have a, 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 a close up of an area saying, oh, look how this right. hand mm-hmm. is touching or whatever, like there was a detail. So that's how I approached the nude. It was my, 
maybe my baby steps. I, I was looking at gesture. I was looking at hand gestures. I was looking at body language. I was looking at more detail and the metaphors of those details. And later on, I felt more comfortable to simply take a step back. And in taking a step back from my subjects, there was more to show. And when there was more to show, that's when I changed from black and white to color. Because the colors around were also interesting. And the light was also great. A lot of it is natural light. But I do have a few things that I can, I can figure out to make it balance. So what changed in terms of the way you were thinking or your approach that allowed you to become more comfortable with stepping back? I think you were the people I was photographing. I started photographing one or two person and then the, and I always show my prints. I think that maybe they're new to me, but I need to be new to them as well. And my way of being new to them is to show my creative process, to show you know, some things work, some things did not work. Let's sit down, let's talk, let's revisit. Uh, if you have time, let's do it again. It's really a creative process. And I think that the people that I uh, work with, that want to collaborate with me, they enjoy the process itself. If we have at the end of it a great image, that's a consequence. It's not really the, the goal. I think yeah. the goal is that we spend the time together, that we enjoy each other's company, so in that sense, I do show to them all the, the proofs. I like to show them all the proofs also to say that I'm not trying to sneak a shot out of them, try to sneak a moment or steal an image. So I really show it very openly, very barely to them on my work. And in doing so, that's how we earn trust with each other. That's, that's like how they understand that they can trust me and in doing so, eventually they said, well, why don't you also photograph me with my friend or with my sister or with my boyfriend or my father or my grandparents? So I needed to step back because I started to know more people and because the people willing to be in my, my work started to come as a duet or a trio or fours. And the next questioning came up, how do you bring at the time I was photographing with the Hasselblad with a square format. And mm -hmm. if you think about people, we're mostly rectangles, we're standing rectangles. So then my mind was never so much about having naked people in my frame. Uh, my mind kind of goes more like, how do I have four rectangles into a square? <laughs> <laughs> so, and how do I make that composition interesting? And how do I use a predictable point of entrance? for the viewer outside and how on top of it all do I do it in a way that is not gratuitous and I don't get to review everything that is maybe magically happening in front of me. How do I share just a sliver of that with the outside world? Yeah. What's really uh, fascinating to me. Well, it's what I feel when I look at the images and that collaboration and that relationship that you had with your, your subjects really comes across in the images because, you know, there's a lot of nude work that's done out there, but I, it often feels like the, the subject is being objectified, whether it's the man or a woman who's being photographed and that, that they're really just a physical object that's being photographed. Right. That, that, that sort of there's a sense of them as a person doesn't exist. Yeah, I'm more in love with the people that I photograph than with photography itself. Like I don't, under, you know, I sometimes you, you you see, you know, like we were talking a little earlier, like teaching. You see a lot of uh, students come in because they love photography, and I do enjoy photography, but I have a very easy, easy love to the person just in front of me. Like I. And, and, and that doesn't mean I have a love, a, a, a relationship with them other than the mm -hmm. photography. But I just have, I just think that it's really interesting. I'm very curious about what is it that we do when we are here on planet Earth. Like I really think about those things. Like we are, if you take a step back and a bird's eye view or, you know, nowadays we have like international space station. Let's just, let's just go out there together. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in space. There's nothing. It's a huge vacuum, right? And we have on planet Earth, this beautiful planet, and we have water and we have the oceans and we have the air and we have the 
the trees and we have animals and we have people. And I just think it's a miracle. I just think it's a miracle that we happen to be alive. And for me, it's more interesting for me to sit here, have a conversation with you. To me, that's a rich moment. Yeah. The same way that it would be a rich moment photographing someone. I've heard you say that part of the, the thing that was sort of impetus for your photographs is that there was a large sort of physical distance between you and family and people that you cared about. And that this kind of your photography really allowed you to sort of create that for your for yourself. Yeah. Was it family that was, you know, back in in Brazil or was it just friends and people that you had met and over the passage of time that you had lost connection with? If you could, ex you know, explain that yeah. a little more. Mm -hmm. So my family was, um, I was born in Brazil. My, my father came work in Brazil and my whole family, both of my parents are German and my whole family, the parents, gr uh, grandparents and cousins and aunts, they were always very far away. They were always in Germany. And back then, you wouldn't just fly to see them, right? You wouldn't even call. You would call twice a year on Christmas and maybe your birthday. You would talk for, you know, it was a luxury to talk for 15 minutes on an international call. It was very different times. I was born in 69. So the, the, I have done a lot of things in my life. I, when I was born, Brazil was still a military regime. The, there was this distance with my immediate family And I lived in a country that is Latin, where all of my friends in school had huge families. And I had a very tiny family. I had my sister, my father, and my mother. And they happened to, at some point, get separate. So it became even smaller. So in that sense, I was always looking for an extended family. And photography, in a way, gave me a chance or gave me the excuse to say, hey, can I hang out? Can I take a picture? Can I be part of this? Can I? What can I do while we're together? Now, that realization came to my mind, I think more in a hindsight, right? Nowadays, I can look it back and I can see, oh, that is possibly what was happening. But why it was happening, I didn't know. I didn't know that that was the case. But now when I look back in time, it's pretty clear. You know, when you were starting your work and you were in school and you started making these these nudes, how did you start thinking about what you were going to do in terms of a career? Because I know that, you know, when you teach students, you know, they often ask, well, how can I make a living from doing what I'm doing? Yeah. You know, if you focus primarily on nudes, you know, other than sort of the fine art market, you know, it doesn't necessarily translate into commercial work. Right, right. right. So what were you sort of, how were you thinking in terms of during that, during those early periods that this is the kind of work that I love to do, but how am I going to be able to sustain it? Yeah, I never really put a financial pressure on the, on my fine art work because I never thought that it was going to go anywhere other than uh, me putting some images on my own walls. Uh, I, I used to live in San Francisco. I had one of those a wagon kind of apartments that has this long corridor. And my whole goal was always to just fill it up with images for myself. Like I wasn't thinking about selling. I wasn't thinking about approaching a gallery. I just wanted to have them. I had a, I, at the time I had a small studio in a group, in an, in a, in a building with multiple artist studios. And I started making money by photographing products So photographing what the other artists were doing, either doing copy work of other artists painting, or I had a friend of mine that did glass blowing. So I would photograph all of his beautiful bottles. I was just doing, oh, I had, there was another person, a wonderful guy that would import uh, beautiful teapots from China. <laughs> so I was making money on a, on small commercial jobs. Okay. And I, never wanted money or, or financial worries to enter my fine art work. And I also, and to this day, I don't really bring money into the equation on my fine art because I also don't want to pay the models. I think that that creates an unbalance. I think that the people that, I, that want to be part of my work and we want to do something together, we should be there because we both enjoy being on a creative process. If I am paying for the modeling time, 
then the balance is a little off. Then maybe mm-hmm. I can have an idea. The person might think that they cannot say no to me. You see, like if we're there together, if, if I have an idea and someone doesn't like it and they're not being paid, they just tell me. I was like, I don't like this idea. Let's try something else. I'm like, okay, let's do something else to compensate them for their time. Of course, I give them the prints and 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 do things, that, you know, sometimes they, they want some images of, of, of them together with their partners or, or give a, a, a portrait of them to the, to, to their family members. So that's all fine. Like we do that. We do what, what is also good for them. Uh, a lot of times I end up choosing the images that they think is too pensive or too quiet. And they many times prefer the images that they're laughing and, you know, the more, the more standard lifestyle image that mm-hmm. you would, that you would imagine and that you would accept. I often tell people it, it's not it's not really if you're worried about making a living, then you should be doing more commercial work. Like photography has this beautiful thing. It's not like painting, right? Photography has this part that we could do the fine art, but you can also do the commercial. You can apply the art of photography in a commercial sense. I was doing commercially anything that it would take so that I could bring some of the money into the fine art without compromising. And it was not until 9-11. It was when 9-11 happened that suddenly the commercial world went down and suddenly a lot of galleries were still happening. And at that time, a gallery director, I, I, I always went to galleries. I always enjoyed. It was still, you know, early 90s. It was still that sense that on a Saturday, if you don't know what to do, you will go to the gallery because you would definitely meet someone over there. And in San Francisco at the time, you had people like Larry Sultan, you had people like uh, Ruth Bernhard. They would go to the gallery on the weekend and you would eventually run into them or have conversation with the gallery owner or or enjoy uh, learning further about certain artists. Uh, Many times the artists would be there just to sign a book or answer questions. Uh, I think it was, you had more of a community base back then before the digital world. And I would go many times because I just wanted, because I enjoyed that environment. And in one of those moments, a gallery director at the time called Heather Snyder, she asked me if I was a collector. And I said, no, oh my, I'm not a collector. I'm just, I, I was still a student and I, mentioned I just enjoyed I'm so happy and grateful to be here and to be able to listen and be part of this she said well but you come so often do you what kind of work do you do and I said well I I'm figurative (laughs) and then and then she said well can I see some so she kind of insisted a little bit to see it I was still a little bit shy Uh, I didn't want to bring the work to the gallery because I didn't think it was ready and she said well it doesn't matter what we can do why don't I come over on a Sunday to your place, to your apartment and take a look at what you have? And so she came over at the time. I didn't have a table. I had, uh, I had a, my bed was on top of my flat files. So it was kind of high up bed <laughs> and I kind of cleared it out and, and put the, the proof sheets. She looked at it and she said, Hey, do you mind if I circle a few and maybe we can just choose 15 to 20 and you would print them and bring to the gallery for the owner to take a look. And that's how it happened. It's not that I went out thinking I was going to be a fine art photographer. I was doing something that I liked doing. I was concerned about making a living. I was doing the product photography, but I wasn't putting the financial pressure into my personal work. What were the uh, initial reactions to the work? So the I printed like little 11 by 14 prints at the time. It was all black and white and you would still do the mat. You put the, you know, mm-hmm. you cut the mat and you make it the whole presentation. You had the gloves and I went in. The gallery owner at the time opened the box and, you know, moved one print after another, took a look at it. And then he brought them all back into the right position, closed the box and he said, okay. And I said, okay, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he said well let me stay with your box for some time i'll show it to some of the collectors that stop by come in and out and we'll see what happens i'm like all right 
And so I think that the galleries, that's something that the young artists also need to understand. The galleries have their own pressures. Uh, so I think that the, he tested it with the collectors. Uh, there was some acceptance. He then included into one group show. Uh, funny enough, it was a women's, women's photographer group show. Then he included on, a, on, on, on photographing the male nude group show. And he realized that collectors would gravitate once the work was on the wall the collectors would gravitate towards my work, maybe because it was different or it was less loud or mm. calmer. So they started maybe feeling comfortable in front of it in a group of all nudes or a group with, with different photographers photographing the group. It seemed at the time, that was the feedback from the gallery owner. It seemed at the time that people would gravitate and then uh, lean and spend more time in front of my works. You know, at the gallery, they're always paying attention to those things. He then eventually, uh, I, a, a few months later, maybe maybe five, six months later, invited me to do a solo show. And that was that. How soon after that did you end up getting the first book put out by Steidl? That was a while. Uh, Steidl took some time, not, not, not necessarily because of Steidl, just because 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And a lot of publishers, I already wanted to be published. I was already looking a little bit, doing some research. And I had a list of maybe 10 publishers to reach out. And after 9-11, the list became four existing publishers because six went out of business. So it was hard and um, it took time to reach out. It took time for the industry to recover I think my first book with Tidal was in 2004, and the first exhibition was maybe 96. Though all my on-location workshops were canceled last year, I began teaching a workshop through Nobechi Creative called Using Your Life to Jumpstart Your Photography. It was meant to address the creative frustration that many people experience being locked up at home for weeks and months, and it turned into something so much more. In this multi-week course, I guide photographers as they use their own lives to create a photographic project that is personal, beautiful, and liberating. Each session has led to each photographer learning how to move beyond the singular photograph and produce a body of work that they can not only be proud of, but becomes a launching point for even greater things. It's been such a pleasure to lead people in having incredible breakthroughs in such a short period of time. My next class begins in May, and it's limited to only 10 students to allow for as intimate and personal an experience as possible. And I would love for you to join us. To find out more details about the course, visit nobechicreative.com or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. And thanks to the many of you who continue to support the show financially. It's your financial contributions that have sustained us over the various phases of the show. And without you, the show wouldn't be what it is today. Our show is not the biggest thing in podcasting, but it's an important part of podcasting, especially for the photographic community. And I'm so thankful for you for being part of our journey together. Now, you can help to contribute to our work by becoming a Patreon supporter today. You can do that by contributing $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Just $5 a month from you would make a big difference. Thank you for being with us for the last 15 years, and I really look forward to sharing more with you in the months and years to come. One of the interesting things about uh, you and your work is that though you may produce a good good body of work, a lot of them you don't you don't share. Not only on the internet, but it just doesn't end up in, in the galleries or in, in the book. Tell me about your, your process in terms of not only just producing the work, but making a decision as to what work you are going to put, put out there. Well, I think I wanted to be work that, that 
might be in some ways a little slower to understand or maybe quieter, but that takes longer. It's like a bouquet that takes time to open up or like a flower or a, the petals grow. You know, they open up slowly over time. When I come back from my from the shoots, I put all the images, regardless if it's a film or digital, I print, I make small lab prints and I put them all up on my cork board and I look at them for some time. It takes me, editing takes me a long time. It takes me, I don't know, three to five months. And I look at them every day and every day I take a few images down uh, because, because I solved it, because that image maybe was striking at the first moment, but after, after 10 days, it was over. The, there was nothing else to say. Yeah. Uh, after, you know, some images you think, oh my God, this is the most amazing image ever. And you might be overlooking a gem that is right next to it that might be a little bit more quiet, but you would have, it would unfold over time much nicely. When you have them up on the cork board, are you just looking at, at it as a singular image or are you looking at potential relationships between images on, on, on the board? Yeah, I'm thinking about relationships. I'm thinking about, first, I'm thinking about single image. The hardest question is, what's a great image of someone I know and care about versus what's an image that has metaphors and can live as a, as a work of art? Mm -hmm. So those are two different things, right? Mm -hmm. I try to bring the, the vocabulary of metaphor into photography. And so that part starts by selecting the individual compositions, the individual images, the individual mood in, in a single shot. But then I'm not interested on the single shot. Like I kind of like to create sentences or create a, a little novel. So all my books, I like to think of being a bit of a suspended reality. Mm -hmm. You know, like photography, you have these two pendulums. You have the, the side of photography that is more a record, the, the evidence. And then you have the other side of the pendulum in photography, which is maybe more the imagination or a, or a dream or a fantasy or possibly a a par parallel reality. And I think I'm more on that side. Were you taking that same sensibility f with the images that come later in the book that are more of the natural world? Are you talking about the nature shots? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the nature shots, I uh, like to bring in because it, to me, it informs who the person is. Or, you know, when I went to Brazil, I had to photograph the rainforest. That's what we have all around us. Uh, it's overwhelming. E even I am from Sao Paulo, which is a really big city. But even in a huge, huge city, you have these mango trees shooting and breaking the asphalt apart because it's just like nature is just so huge and strong and overwhelming and sultry. So I cannot disconnect nature from the people because it's in their it's in their psychic, it's in their unconscious, it's, it's part of who they are. And when I photographed here in the Mojave Desert, it was a little bit of that too. It was this, it had a, in a way, it had a spiritual solitude. It had a certain bareness, a certain abandon that was interesting to me to explore. Though you're largely known for the nude work, did you find it it's sort of a challenge of sort of translating all the experience that you had, you know, you had honed from shooting people and translating that, all that knowledge and that technical ability to a completely different subject matter. Yes. I learned a really hard lesson when I was uh, at the rainforest because I was photographing this almost, I had this feeling that I was inside a cathedral with huge trees, with canopies all the way up with depot light coming through. Uh, what you don't see on the images is the, 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 hu the in insane amount of birds and insects and their sounds uh, all at the same time, surround sound. And it's just like insane and amazing to be there. But the first time that I photographed, and when I say the first time, it's like I spent a whole month there. The first month I looked at the results and it was terrible. It was green on green, it was flat. <laughs> It was really horrible. It had nothing to do with this sensorial presence of actually being there. It was just 
flat green and I couldn't even separate one tree from another. That's when I realized I had to go back and photograph the forest with the same love and attention from my early work, from the black and white, where I need to photograph the detail that I need to photograph also with maybe selective focus and give attention to some elegance that is more smaller instead of such a grand scale, you know, to find the, to find the beauty in the small within the huge. Yeah. That parallels exactly what you were doing back in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So I photographed the forest. I started paying attention as if I was paying attention to the fingertips. So I wasn't photographing an entire tree. I was photographing the edges of a spring uh, bud opening up or so. One of the things that's really interesting when you're working with multiple noons is the relationship of the different figures within the space. And that's always sort of intrigued me because there's an, there's a relationship that's sort of implied, but there's no real direct interaction among the subjects. Right. I'm really curious as to what part of the process was in terms of making the images with that sort of intention in, in mind. I think the idea is that I would like to photograph a human being in front of us and not overly sexualize the frame. To some people, a nude is already a bit uncomfortable, maybe. Uh, to me, a nude is the most basic form. It's just the most humble presence. It's just what it is. It's part of the truth. It's a little bit of a disarming, un un unguarding. It's also, for me, a sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. So that has to be respected. I don't want to be naked and have someone bother me, right? I want to be naked and be free and not have anyone bother me. That's what I mean by sense of freedom. To me, when I have the, you know, this, uh, the chance of working with people that, that, that feel comfortable that way, I man many times I say my best work starts when people forget that they're naked. And I think that that carries on to the viewer. When the viewer forget that they're looking at images of people naked, that's when the work is speaking for itself. Like when you say, I look at your work, and at some, at some point, I no longer perceive them in the nudes. Maybe the first, maybe in the first pages of the book, you realize, oh, wow, Mona does nudes. But after you flip a few pages, you realize that maybe, maybe the composition, maybe the metaphors, maybe the eye contact, or maybe other things are happening there. And maybe the viewer, as well as the models, have forgotten that they're naked. And that's when I am doing my, a good job. That's when I think I'm addressing what I would like to do, which is just to photograph the human in front of us. And I'm not sure if I answer your question, but, but in doing so, at that moment in time, when I'm photographing a couple of people that already know each other, of course, into one frame, when I have a composition with two, three people, those people know each other. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there together. I'm not doing any casting. I'm photographing yeah. people that say, hey, would you photograph me with... Uh, you know, I had a great experience with you. Uh, I enjoyed uh, receiving the prints and looking at the results and the way you photographed, the way you gave me a chance to also give you a little bit of a feedback. Would you do this again? Can I bring my cousin? And my cousin happens to be together with this other person. So it would be the three of us. Mm -hmm. I'm like, sure, if you guys are comfortable, that's fine with me. So then when I then need, before the photo shoot, I then need to, photo, I then need to think, how am I going to bring three people, three rectangles, like you said, like we talked earlier? How do I bring three rectangles into an interesting composition that has some kind of metaphor at the same time that speak to their own relationship, to their own dynamics, to their own social fabric, and how their story will come into my puzzle pieces and how are we going to bring this all together? And a lot of times I just let them be themselves. I think that their own body language will be a lot more beautiful than anything that I may be able to impose. A lot of times I really want them to feel comfortable on their own. I might, I might just, because of the composition, because of the limitations of the frame, I might tell them, move a little to the left, move a little to the right, bring your feet a little closer because it's, mm -hmm. it's cutting. But that's about it. I try to really, I don't like to direct too much i like to observe and i can move i i can i photograph people like i maybe i would photograph sculptures i'm i do the job they 
They just need to find a point and a balance and a harmony where they don't feel any more that they're naked, where they feel comfortable and that they feel that uh, they can be themselves and that they are accepted as themselves. Yeah, it, you know, issues of body image, especially in this country, are pretty pervasive. But when I do see a lot of the nude work that I see now, it tends to be much younger people who seem to be less burdened or by the whole issues. And, you know, I, I suspect that people, as they get older, or have always had body issues. So in terms of how how that works in terms of the people that you choose to, to, to photograph, because, you know, some of the images in the early, in the early parts of the book are largely people that are in a, within a very small demographic in terms of, you know, their body types and, and their youth. Yeah. Um, but I know that you photograph a diverse variety of subject matter, but talk to me about, you know, the issues and the challenges you face when, yeah. You when you want to photograph someone who does have those sort of body issues. Well, it kind of happens naturally. First of all, early on I was also younger. So, we were all younger earlier on and I was <laughs> photographing people that were in a way close to my age, but since then I also got older. I think that the key to this is when you ask me how do I choose people? Because I actually don't choose people. Like we find each other, right? I work with people that want to be, that want to create something together. So automatically, just by that format in its own, it is people that maybe already feel comfortable in the nude, in whatever shape and form they have. That is the difference. I don't necessarily go out casting. So I don't really choose in that sense. If someone gives me the privilege of photographing them, I see that as a gift and I want to be there. And I would photograph them if at the end of the day they say, hey, you know what, I have a, I don't feel, which has happened. I don't feel so good about my body. I love the images that you did of me, but I actually don't want that to be out in the open. I feel reserved. I enjoy the time with you. I enjoy that you accept me the way I am. To me, that was super important, but I don't want you to use the images. I totally understand that. There's no problem. I like, I like what I do. 80% of my work is hanging out with my friends. 20% of it is photographing. To me, if at the end we don't use any of those images, that's fine. Uh, I am very prolific. I do a lot of work. I enjoy what I do. It comes to me easily, it comes to me naturally. I'm, I'm a charismatic person. I put people at easy very, I put people at, uh, at easy very naturally. Uh, I don't, they can see that I don't approach them because all I want is photograph. They see that I might approach them because I want to sit down like I am here with you and we have a conversation and I want to discover something new about the universe. Sometimes it has happened that people feel a little too self-conscious and mm -hmm. I would not, I would not have stopped my love for that person or the wish to include that person in the work, but maybe they would say, I'm not ready for it. Yeah. So that has happened. The other thing that has happened with age, specifically with age, and I'm talking about a series that I did with people that were 70 and above, and that we could, I couldn't predict that. I, you know, I'm photographing people that are 70 and above for the first time. That was maybe, maybe 10 years ago. I did a whole series of that. And they enjoyed, they liked it, but a couple of them came to me after the fact and they said, you know, when you grow older, people stop looking at you. When you go to the supermarket, people don't see you anymore. So when you came and approached us and showed some interest to photograph us, maybe the first one was maybe a grandparent of someone I was already photographing and, and then it got related to other people. But when you first approached us, we were so delighted that someone younger than us is interested in us. We wanted to be there for you. We wanted to support your ideas as a young artist and we wanted to pose for you. And it was a great experience. But now that you want to publish it in a book, <laughs> it just so happened that we realized that our son is married to this lovely woman who has a very conservative family. And now we are concerned of the parents of her seeing us naked. Mm. So people that are older have a much 
wider network of people that they know is a much more complex social structure. And we don't need to use those images. It's all fine. I, I learned so much photographing older people. I didn't realize, you know, some, some of the conversations I had with them were just so terrific. They said, they said, Mona, I am 78 for the first time. For the first time, I'm 78. I don't know what, I don't know. It, it's, it's the first time that I am this old and doing this. No one told me how it was going to be. So I think I learned something else. Maybe from all these conversations and all the time, maybe I didn't have work that I can use and share with you, but I had lessons of life. Yeah. That's one of the things I like about the way you work is that the priority is about the relationships. And yeah, it's important. It's a beautiful thing because I know that the, even with photographs that I've made of strangers on the street, if I had some moment of engagement with them, it makes the photographs all the more special. And I like that even if people aren't photographing nudes, that they take away that lesson that it's about the moment that you're sharing with the person, the relationship, even though it may be for just that moment of the shoot. Right. That there's, there's so much the value there and that. You know, the obsession and the preoccupation with the image to the exclusion of the, of the experience with the person, you're really missing out when that happens. Yeah. And I really don't think it's a show and tell. I mean, photography mm -hmm. is full of that, right? In, in my, mm -hmm. you know, when I was studying, starting photography, most of the people in the, in the class, they started photographing good looking girls and they wanted to photograph models and they wanted to photograph uh, th there is that allure in photography. Photography is a modern medium, is a fast medium, and everyone wants to play the sexy photographer. Um, <laughs> it's part of it. But to me, it was really trying to find that very early relationship that I had with art, the, the, the little moment of levitation. To me, it was more about that. What makes... What makes my heart skip a bit? What makes me go, wow? And that in itself, like to jump into your next question, yeah. that in itself is a little lost when you know too much about the art market. I think when you get too much, too much into the art market, we get confused, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes a little bit more about the transaction and not so much about the conversation, unfortunately. And in terms of sort of negotiating that, you know, because, you know, you have this relationship you have with, with with your subject matter. You have a relationship with your work. And then the people out there who are interested in, in you know, say, buying prints, they have an appreciation for, for the work. But there's still this sort of dialogue and negotiation you have to deal with the gallery owners and, the, you know, right. the curators and all those things. And I'm just wondering in terms of that part of it, was it something that you struggled to get acclimated to? Yeah, I think it's the part of creating the works come to me very naturally. Um, I'm a people person. It's easy for me to photograph someone in the nude. Like it, um, I, I, I had a friend that used to say, oh, my God, I get so nervous. If someone undresses in front of me in the camera, I don't know what to do. I forget about aperture. I don't even know what to do. I probably will run away. <laughs> and to me, to me, it feels very natural when it comes to. When it comes to the fine art world or the, the art fairs, uh, the galleries, the collectors, the publishers, I'm very grateful because that is the entire support system. It is because of them that I'm able to continue. It's because of every single exhibition that I do and the sale of that work that I can then go out and do my next series. I don't have sponsors. I don't have corporate sponsorships. I don't have any of those things. It's really the support of collectors and the galleries and the media and you, us talking now, sharing that to a wider audience. That is uh, the support of the, of the community around us and the art scene and, and all of those elements do need to come together. But the day-to-day -day conversations are very different, right? I tend to call that the administration. Yeah. The administ the paperwork. It's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend a photographer for our listeners to explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've oh, long admired or yeah, someone yeah, yeah. you've recently discovered. So who, who would that photographer yeah. be and why? I went recently, before the pandemic, I saw an exhibition of Michalina Thomas here in LA at the MOCA. And I love her work. I think it's amazing. I think she's pushing photography into a wider, you know, you would enter the room. She she put set up a whole ambience there. I, I felt that I was entering her work. She does collage, she does nudes. She elevates the people that she photographs. And I think that that's important. I don't like to see work where we bring each other down. I like to see work that brings us closer together. And I like to see work that lifts up in a way our spirit. And I think that Michalina Thomas is doing a great job. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mona. It was a real pleasure. All mine. Thanks to Mona for joining us. You can find out more about her and her work by visiting monacoon.com. And if you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews have allowed us to grow. Thanks to Derek Pronto from the U.S. and Dog Walk Photographer for their five-star review. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or make a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Alberto from the Noisecast, Juan Rodriguez, Pedro Lima, Joel DeYoung, and Derek Fleming for their recent contributions. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>